onto the papers. <clears throat> the first paper is a paper that hopefully all of you have already read. You must understand the gravity of your situation by Steve Hill and Mark Ripto. I, my guess is I'm going to make a botch of this. I am so glad to have Steve on the committee now because I think <coughs> that's the thing for me that was really lacking. We, uh, uh, I mean, Patrizio, he's got some expertise in the biophysics kind of stuff, but we needed a guy who, who could like, you know, he could look at this shit and say, okay, that's a bridge or, you know, that's a hinge or what, you know, to actually do the physics because that's not me. So, Anyway, this falls under the category of biomechanics. And I'm going to go over it really quickly because Steve gave you your full dose of biomechanics yesterday. We've got a little bit more biomechanics to go, and I don't know what I'm talking about anyway when it comes to this stuff. So here's the essence of the paper, or at least what I think of the, is the essence of the paper. There's two ways to move the bar. And what, what, what Steve and Rip are really talking about here mostly is pulls from the floor. There's two ways to move the bar, right? There's actually three but there's two that actually count. The one is to move the bar vertically. And generally what you're doing there is you're exerting, a, you're pushing the planet away from you and the planet is pushing back on you. You're exerting a ground reaction force through your feet on the floor, right? Straight up and down. That the normal force is what we're talking about there. That's the ground reaction force to the middle of the foot. We all know that. The other way to move the bar is horizontally, right? And that's reacted out through the friction force of your foot against the floor so that when you pull the bar this way or your bar pushes this way, your foot doesn't slide along the floor because there's a frictional force there, right? It's via the friction of the foot floor interface and via the mass of the lifter who reacts out a moment arm with the mass of his body, right? Now, you can do lateral, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but it's not optimal. <laughs> Right? It doesn't get you the results that you want, and we're going to ignore that for the rest of our analysis. That was Tamara. Um, so, <clears throat> the point, the point that, that Stephen and Rip make in this article, we, we all know about the horizontal moment arm, right? So if I have a barbell and I hold it out here, right? I've got, a, I, I've got a turning force at the shoulder, and my, if I hold my shoulder steady, I've got a turning force over the middle of my foot. I've got this moment arm, and I've got this force, right? That's the horizontal moment arm, and it's gonna try and turn me this way around the middle of my foot. We all kind of know about that. But what Steve, is, Steve and Rip are talking about here is there's also a vertical moment, and it gets longer the higher the bar comes up off the floor. So if you've got a horizontal displacement, from over the middle of the foot, that moment arm is going to get longer and longer, and that bar is going to get more and more difficult to control because you're going to need a greater counter torque to counteract that. Once you've actually left the floor in a snatch or a clean, right, you actually don't even have that anymore. Now the turning point is no longer the ankle. Now, now the body gets considered to be a, cent a centroid, and you have a center of mass of the, of the barbell lifter system, right? And you can't control it with a reaction force against the floor, and the only thing that you can do, right, is to move your body in the opposite direction as the horizontal displacement of the bar and hope that that corrects it, which it usually won't if the weight is really heavy. This is all discussed in detail in the article. There are some take-home points for me from this. Errors at the beginning of the pull right, are going to be more difficult because of that length of that vertical moment as the bar gets higher off the floor. And they talk about this explicitly in the article. During the first pull, you have a high potential, right, to impart horizontal velocity to the bar using your body mass and using your, your musculature, right? But it's limited by your anthropometry. Your knees get in the way, right? So there's actually not as much that you can do there as you think you might be able to. During the second pull, you can use the mass of your body to impart a large horizontal force to the bar. And this is especially true in the deadlift, but the bar path problem usually isn't that much of a problem in a heavy deadlift anyway. But when you have a heavy clean or a heavy snatch, and you're trying to use this to correct a bar path error, you don't have much time to do it because that second pull is explosive. Does that make sense? You can actually impart a lot of horizontal motion or a lot of horizontal force to the bar, but you don't have any time to do it because it's an explosive pull. 
And then during the rack and racking phase, all you've really got, because you're floating, right? There is no ground reaction force. There is no ground friction force. All you can do is use the mass of your body to try and react it out. And if the bar is forward of you, and the, and the, and the center of mass of the barbell lifter system is forward of you, what's going to happen is there's going to be what is a momentum transfer, by which I assume you meant that you started here and you ended here. That's all you've got is to just travel forward with the bar or lose it or miss the lift. That's all you've got. It's a very, very nice analysis. Every one of these papers is subject to criticism. So here's my criticism of this paper. All right? Just because they came from our site doesn't mean they don't get critique. Here's my critique of this paper. Where are the fucking pictures, dude? Right? This paper, you guys, you, you guys didn't draw us any pictures. And it's astonishing to me because if you give an engineer a pen and a whiteboard, he will draw pictures. He'll fill so, that thing up. So unless. did you see my drawing of the whiteboard? <laughs> yeah, but the article, dude, you could have drawn a picture for the art for us, for us, for us numbskulls. You could have, like, given us a little bit. I've been bit drawing of... a squat position for a year and a half now, and Ripito still makes jokes about it. So, yep. Here for me is the, is the take home message. Deviation from a straight bar path creates unnecessary moments that have to be reacted out if the lift is to be successful. That's, and you all know that, but not everybody knows that. These are necessarily power leaks and inefficiencies. They are, right? And so if, and they're not so much of a problem in a deadlift, in a heavy deadlift, you've got a vertical bar path. In a heavy deadlift, the bar path will be vertical or, or it, you <coughs> don't have a deadlift, right? But in a snatch or a clean, you know, in the snatch, it, it may not be vertical because the lifter has introduced some inefficiency into the bar path because the weight is lighter or, or because the, the the lifter has been taught that the bar path must be this sinuous kind of thing because, because S stands for snatch. You can't argue with that, right? So, uh, and then all you've got then, all you've got, and because there, there will be some inefficiency in the bar path in all but the heaviest pulls from the floor, what have you got to rely on when you're at the bottom of a snatch or you're at the bottom of a clean or at the bottom of a jerk, an explosive lift, and the bar path is not right there Right? And the bar, the bar is a little bit off. You've got a little bit of a moment arm this way or that way. What have you got? What have you got to correct that error? Because the error gets magnified the higher the lift goes. So a snatch, an early pulling error in a snatch gets magnified by the time it gets up to here. What have you got? What have you got at the bottom of the snatch? You got strength. Because at the bottom of the snatch, if your technique isn't perfect and the, and the bar's not racking, and your strength may not be enough, but ultimately it's what you've got, right? It's what you've got to correct that form error and to rack that lift successfully at the bottom. So hidden in this article, which is a biomechanical analysis, hidden in this article, it's actually the subtlest Rip has ever said it, is a very strong argument for strength in the Olympic lifts. It emphasizes the importance of the master cue. The, we all remember the master cue. Actually, I gotta tell you my master cue story. So I've got some really unusual lifters that I coach. They're all over 50. And one day we're talking and, uh, and I said, okay guys, you remember the master cue, right? We've talked about the master cue. What is the master cue? And they look at me like, like they're, all of a sudden they have like lizard faces. You know, they're like, looking at me. It's like, no, I know we've talked about this. The master cue, what is the master cue? I'm like, dude, what is the master cue? The master cue that you can always go to when there's a bar path problem, the lift doesn't feel right, the lift doesn't look right, right? The bar path isn't quite right. I'm trying to give them a clue. The bar path isn't quite right. What is the master cue that we can always go to to try and correct this situation? And Jeff is like, rack it. <laughs> That's the master cue. Problem solved, rack it. That's the master cue. These guys are giving me gray hair. The master cue, the bar is over the middle of the foot in a slot that goes up to heaven from the floor, from the middle of the foot, right? If you have the, the, the lifter think about that, you'll get rid of these unnecessary moments. 
This is one of those argue with this kind of papers that you can print out and if somebody thinks, some, somebody's trying to tell you that there's hidden levers or quantum effects or something like that that necessitate an S-curve in the pull or any deviation from the vertical, right? They have to be able to argue with this and they can't. So this is one of those papers that you can pull out and say, argue with this. That's the power of this paper. It was a very highly scored paper by the, uh, by the committee. Now we come to two very important papers, both by the same group, German group, Hartmann et al. <coughs> the Influence of Squatting Depth on Jumping Performance. This paper was also covered in last year's science review. This falls under the category of biomechanics and squatology. Right? What were the objectives? The objective was to determine which squat variant had the most effect on a joint angle specific performance outcome. So here's the underlying idea, right? It's important for me to have a high vertical jump, right? So how do I train that? Well, the idea is, is that I train my knees at that angle that I'm going to jump from. Similarly, if, I'm, if I want to punch, I want to, I want to like punch with kettlebells. If I'm a martial artist, I want to punch with kettlebells. It's that whole joint angle specific or movement specific resistance training weirdness that people have in their head. And if I'm going to train my jump with squats at that specific joint angle, what am I going to use? I'm going to use the quarter squat, right? So the quarter squat should be superior for my vertical jump from that specific joint angle to any other squat variant because it's specifically training that joint angle, right? And so the authors hypothesized, uh, what they actually hypothesized was that the, back, the quarterback squat would lead to a higher angle specific one rep max, quarter squat, a higher vertical jump and higher rate of mean, a higher mean rate of force development and maximal voluntary contraction on an isometric task at that joint angle. Everybody with me? Okay. So here's their method. They took 36 German dudes and 23 <coughs> German Frau and they tested them for their counter movement jump height, right? Their one rep max in all the squat variants and their mean rate of force development and maximal voluntary contraction at 120 degrees, which was the angle that they used like a quarter squat fucking uncomfortable, uh, uh, the quarter squat angle, right? That's the angle that they used. And then based on those results, they used an algorithm to parallelize them to get three equivalent groups. No power analysis. I like this paper, but there are problems with it. No power analysis, but they parallelized them into three equivalent groups. And those groups trained in, each one of those groups trained in a specific squat variant. There was a front squat group, a back squat group, and a quarter squat group. Front squatters front squatted for the study interval. Back squatters back squatted below parallel. Front squats were also below parallel. And the quarter squatters squatted in a Smith machine to make sure that they were hitting exactly that angle. The article's been criticized on the basis of its use of the Smith machine. But the rationale for the use of the Smith machine, I think, is a good one. They, the, quarter, the full squats were below parallel. Below parallel, below parallel is freaking below parallel, right? Front squats were below parallel. Below parallel is below parallel. But a quarter squat, that's part of the problem with the quarter squat. Where is the quarter squat? It's in there somewhere, right? They used the Smith machine to fix it at 120 degrees. Make sense? They trained for 10 weeks. There was a, a complex protocol, probably more complex than they needed. And then they went back and they did post-testing in the counter movement jump, one rep max for all the squat variants, and the mean rate of force development mean uh, maximal voluntary contraction at 120 degrees. And this is what they found. Everybody increased their quarter squat strength. How could you not, right? Even the control group increased their quarter squat strength, although it wasn't really statistically significant. Everybody increased their quarter squat strength, right? You can see that. No need to actually pour over the numbers that much. Quarter squat gains, the gains that were achieved by the quarter squat group did not transfer. They did not transfer to any other squat variant. So look what happened. Quarter squatters, right, um, increased their quarter squat. They, they had big gains in their quarter squat, actually, right? 
but they actually lost ground on their back squat and they actually lost ground on their front squat. Uh, they actually sort of, yeah, they lost ground, although it wasn't statistically significant, on their front squat, right? Even the control group who sat around and smoked crack and ate Doritos and watched Oprah for 10 weeks didn't lose as much ground as the quarter squatters did on their other squat variant. So it was actually bad for you to quarter squat with regard to your other squat variants. So not only did it not transfer, it actually hurt you, right? The other squat variants all demonstrated transfer with the most transfer being demonstrated by the full back squat. But the real primary outcome was the, was the counter movement jump, right? Uh, only the quarter squatters lost back squat strength. Significant for time, but not for group. They were the only group that actually lost their full squat strength. Even the control group didn't lose their full squat strength. They actually gained a little bit. Probably just from having done squats 10 weeks ago. Oh yeah, I remember <coughs> that, you know? No, totally neuromuscular. The quarter squatters couldn't even hang on to that. And when it came to counter movement jump height and squat jump height, quarter squat failed miserably, right? This is the wrong way to increase your jump height. And jump height is the wrong thing to worry about increasing unless you're a basketball player or something like that, right? But nevertheless, only the quarter squatters and the controls failed to increase their counter movement jump height and their squat jump height. Only the quarter squatters. So the whole idea of joint angle specific training goes out the window. This is not a perfect paper, but it's the best paper on this topic that we've seen. And it really is, it goes a long way to demolishing this joint specific, joint angle specific training hypothesis. The conclusion, joint angle specific training with the quarter squat was inferior to the back squat and the front squat for producing improvements in counter movement jump, squat jump, or general squatting strength. And I think these conclusions do flow naturally from the data. This allows me to dwell on a particular point. Nobody increased their squat variant more than the quarter squatters, right? So the quarter squatters added more weight to their squat variant than anybody else. That should come as a surprise to absolutely nobody. And yet, it absolutely failed to transfer to any other squat variant or to their performance on any of the outcome variables. Pretty miserable. Let's go. So that's, that's the conclusion. Not a perfect study. <coughs> small and short, no power analysis. The data is presented in aggregate. It's a small study that really pisses me off, right? They, they should have shown us what happened to each lifter in each group over time. The Smith machine thing has been criticized again. I think there's a good rationale for the use of the Smith machine. And they did have multiple outcome variables. They did, but they did at least report their primary outcome variable. The primary outcome variable was jumping height. And that was their hypothesis. They reported that, but they reported a lot of other stuff too. That's OK. Uh, I included this because I think it's cool and because it just sort of underscores the argument that, that low bar back squats have nothing to do with Olympic weightlifting, as this figure clearly shows. There is nothing about the low bar back squat that we do that has any relationship to Olympic weightlifting at all. You can see that this is completely different from a low bar back squat. Absolutely no similarity whatsoever. That's one of the big things now. Somebody actually, a, a very prominent American weightlifter recently said, squats are the poison of, America, of, of Olympic weightlifting. Squats are the poison of Olympic weightlifting. An astonishing thing to say. Hartman's second paper, how am I doing on time? Hartman's second paper, is not an original investigation. It is a review article. It is in what we call an implicit literature review. He was able to pull the papers he wanted and ignore the papers he didn't. That said, it's a pretty important paper. It also falls under the category of biomechanics and squatology. And we just jump right to the conclusions because he, you know, he basically looked at all this literature and he reached his own conclusions about what we know about what squats do to passive structures of the knee and spine. And by what he means by passive structures are non-contractile structures. Bone, cartilage, particularly cartilage, 
right? Bone, cartilage, tendons, ligaments. That's what he's talking about here. Because, as you all know, squats are bad for the knees. They're going to damage the cartilage of your knees. And they're bad for your discs in your back. These are the passive structures that he's talking about. They're not really passive, as we'll see, but that's what they're usually referred to. Here are the conclusions that he reaches real quick. Flawed cadaver studies of patellofemoral and tibiofemoral loading failed to take into account the wrapping effect. So the wrapping effect that he's talking about here is the patellar tendon wrapping and fitting into this groove between the condyles of the femur, right? And as you get to the bottom of the squat, that whole thing just sort of locks in. Something about converting tension to compression. I don't know. Does that sound familiar to anybody, right? It's that whole thing. And at the bottom of the squat, that locks in. At the top of the squat or the quarter squat, that doesn't, it's not locked in, right? It, because it's not a static situation, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. If you, I tried to find a really good picture of the wrapping effect of the patellar tendon, couldn't find one. But what I did find was a lot of other literature about wrapping effect, and it's not just the wrapping effect of the patellar tendon. Hartmann talks about the patellar tendon, but there's all kinds of wrapping effects at the bottom of the squat, because as it turns out, the passive structures of the knee and the musculature and the tendons and, and the collateral ligaments and the ACL and the PCL, all that stuff at the bottom of the squat, we now recognize at that end of range of motion, everything kind of locks down there. That's where the stuff just gets the tightest. It's just nature has designed it so that when you get to the bottom of the squat, everything just sort of tweaks down and locks down. That's where everything gets tight, like a little machine. Right? That's where everything's the tightest and that's where the forces are balanced because that's the static situation that Steve was talking about yesterday. So it's not just a patellar tendon wrapping effect. There, there is a wrapping effect of all the soft tissue and the contractile tissue around the knee at the bottom of the squat that balances the forces across the knee. <clears throat> Deep squats enhance the contact of the articulating surface. Half squats are particularly problematic. Let's look at this. If you, it, it, it's kind of a subtle thing, and it's probably hard to see from here, but when I'm standing up here, I have the most femoral tibial contact. The, the contact between the, my femoral condyle and my tibial plateau is maximized here. I have the largest area, right? At the bottom of the squat, I have a somewhat smaller area, but it's really the most, it's really the smallest. If you look at cadaver studies, it's really smallest right about here. That's where, the, that's where the contact is the smallest, at about the quarter squat level, right? This makes sense from a natural perspective. Um, it doesn't make sense if you decide that you're going to do quarter squats and convert this into a static part of your training. So this, if, if you try to achieve a static situation here, as opposed to the bottom of the squat, you have no wrapping effect, and you have the minimal amount of femoral tibial contact. So the pressure on that is going to be monumentally higher. This is made worse by the fact that when you're quarter squatting, you're quarter squatting a shit ton of weight because everybody can quarter squat 600 pounds and divert that force to the tiny little contact area in their patellofemoral region. So the problem gets magnified there. What is this really all about? What this is really all about is this. Hartman doesn't talk about this explicitly, but I will. What this is really all about is you were never meant to be here. You were meant to pass through here, right? You're meant to be here or you're meant to be here, right? You can spend all afternoon here. You can spend all afternoon here. That is just a way station. You're not supposed to spend. Who spends any time here? Nobody, right? And so nature didn't design you to lock down and achieve a static balanced position there. She intended you to pass through. That joint angle is supposed to be a dynamic joint angle, not a static joint angle. That's what this is all about. That's what this is all about. <clears throat> heavier load, where we talked about this, heavier load in the partial squat variant <clears throat> makes the problem worse. Hartmann talks about the knee shear and vertebral shear trade-off. Now, Stephen and I had a long talk yesterday about shear. Mm -hmm. and shear is kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a very specific term in engineering. 
but we all know in a, in a more general sort of loosey-goosey sense what we mean by shear, right? So at the bottom of the squat, if I have a knee slide forward, right, my back isn't going to be as vertical. We've gone or as, as uh, horizontal. We've all gone over that before, so I can keep my back more vertical. If I let my knees slide forward, that's the front squat, right? That's the end of that continuum, right? If I let my knees slide forward. When I let my knees slide forward, I've got more shearing force on the knee, more of a tendency to do this on the knee for the condyles to slide on the plateau. But if I keep my knees back, like we do in our model, I have to bend over more, and now I've got more of a shearing force on my back. Hartmann describes this trade-off in detail. That's exactly what it is. It's a trade-off between those dislocating forces on the knee and the quote-unquote shearing forces on the back that tend to want to make the vertebrae do this. Now we, Steve talked in detail yesterday about how we convert that shearing force through the activity of our spinal erectors into a compression force that churns the spine into a beam. Now the spine is not a slinky anymore, it's a beam, right? And that's the whole point. Because I don't have anything analogous that I can do with my knees, right? What is the contractile structure around my knees that prevents my knees from doing this? At the, there isn't one. It's just tendon and ligament. And it will adapt, but it won't adapt like musculature, right? And it doesn't help my back. Whereas when I'm applying a shear stress to my back at the bottom of the squat, I can adapt to that. I want to adapt to that. That's part of the whole point. So that's the trade-off. That's why we keep our knees back in our variant of the squat, in our model. Does that all make sense? Okay. He talks about passive tissue adaptation. I mentioned this briefly in my lecture last year, right? Uh, there is data that passive tissues and even cartilage undergo adaptation to stress. Adaptation to stress, not to strain. Strain will damage the tissue, but stress will force an adaptation of these passive tissues. He talks about the balance of forces around the knee. I don't need to belabor that because that was handled beautifully by Steve yesterday. He looks at epidemiologic evidence about tendinopathies of the tendons and ligaments surrounding the knee and the back, and they don't appear to be increased with any particular squat variant, which is not to say that athletes don't have more tendinopathies, because they do, right? We get beat up. We just get beat up in a different way than sedentary people get beat up. But there's no particular squat variant that seems to produce any particular range of tendinopathies more than any other. And he talks about the adaptability of spinal structures to training loads, right? Disc and M plate adaptations, bone density, we know about that. And again, no epidemiologic data of increased clinically relevant back pathology in weightlifters when compared to other athletes, right? Or the general public and probably the opposite. There's actually some indication in the literature that you know, athletes have back problems, but weightlifters actually seem to have fewer. My guess is that what he doesn't mention is, my guess is that when, when weightlifters have a back problem or have a back injury, they really have a back injury. That's been my observation. The, the incidence is low, the intensity is high. That would be my guess. Two very, very important papers, right? If you were to contact me and ask me to send you the full text of those, I would not do that. That would be wrong, right? So you're going to have to find a way to get them. Okay? Very, very, very worthwhile reading. <clears throat> Our next article is Death by Prowler, right? It was an article, I got 10 minutes. All right, next article is Death by Prowler. This was uh, published on the Starting Strength website. I shouldn't say this. There's no good that will come out of Reynolds knowing this, but I'm gonna tell you anyway. This was, this was hands down the number one rated article by the science community. This article received the lowest score, meaning the best score of all the articles that we reviewed. Why is that? First of all, it was really well written. It was really reliable, obviously relevant, right? And what I loved about it, I nominated this article. What I love about this article is it's a, a, it's a double whammy, right? It's a programming article on conditioning with the Prowler, very practical, right? And it's an overview of muscle bioenergetics. That's just too cool for school. I love that, right? And I'm actually not going to belabor too much 
the whole prowler flu thing. The, you, you, all, you guys know all this. It's a concentric only conditioning tool and it can work in the energy system. We're going to talk about the energy system. Prowler programs, it's all there. Just go read it. It's a free article. It's in, it's in your thing, right? And all of those programs are useful. And all of them can be adapted to whatever your particular conditioning needs are. I like, I have a prowler now, and I like the heart rate uh, guided programs. So what we do is we put on our heart rate monitors, we go out, we start light because we're old, we start with the empty prowler, we do some pushes, get warmed up, and then we start adding weight or we add, or we add runs, we progress it, we log it, just like we do our, our, our weightlifting sets, right? And what, what we do is we look at some percentage of our maximal heart rate, push the prowler, we, you can't monitor your heart rate while you're pushing, that's, just, that's, a, that's a problem. You push the prowler for 100 feet, that's our standard, right? You get there and you go, shit, shit. And, and you wait for your heart rate to hit your target and then you push again. Very effective, very effective, right? Uh, so all those protocols are in there. Use those protocols and use your imagination. You'll come up with an excellent conditioning program. What I like about this paper, uh, besides that, is the bioenergetics. And so that's what we're going to review real quick here. Um, because I think you should know this stuff. You have two major bioenergetic energy systems, the aerobic and the anaerobic. The aerobic happens in mitochondria. You use oxygen to oxidize food substrates and to achieve the maximum amount of ATP because with oxygen, you can burn that shit down to the ash, right? You can burn the carbohydrate and, and fat down to CO2 and water. You can get every last bit of energy that is possible to get out of those out of those bonds, right? And then you have an, and that system, this aerobic system is slow. It's because it takes time to cook that shit down, right? And get all that ATP out of there. It takes time, right? It's a slow cooker, but it's got a high capacity. It's a big slow cooker, right? You're gonna get a lot of ATP from it, right? That's beta oxidation, oxidative phosphorylation. And then you have the anaerobic system, low capacity. It's, not, it's a very low capacity system. It does not provide a lot of ATP, but it provides it fast and at a very, very high rate for a very short period of time. And it doesn't use oxygen, so it's inefficient, right? It's like the steak that I got from Rip last night. It got seared, here you go. So it wasn't fully cooked, right? <laughs> but it was efficient, yeah, it was fast, right? High power. This is what we call, there are two systems here. There's a substrate level phosphorylation system, which is super fast. That's just transferring high energy phosphate from one molecule to another, right? From ATP to the myosin, or from creatine phosphate to ATP to the myosin. Super fast, it's right there, it's ready to go. That's your jump, right? And then there's glycolysis, which isn't as fast as substrate level phosphorylation, but it's pretty goddamn fast. Right? And that's burning, not really burning, but that's fermenting glucose down to lactate or pyruvate. Pretty fast. Which energy system do we train? We're here. We are firmly here. This is what we do. We're going to talk more today about why that's okay. That's what we should do. <clears throat> so, everything in blue is in the cytoplasm and is anaerobic. Everything in red is in the mitochondrion and is aerobic. This is carbohydrate, glycogen to glucose, undergoes glycolysis, gets your pyruvate. Pyruvate gets transferred to the mitochondrion, and you have the, the, the crossroads here, acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is the crossroads of metabolism, right? Glycolysis is fast. And it gets you your ATP fast so you can do the work. And this is the substrate level phosphorylation here, creatine transfer to ATP transfer to work. So this is all fast. This is all super fast. But it's inefficient. <coughs> For one molecule of glucose, you get two molecules of ATP. Not very efficient, but fast, right? That acetyl-CoA that you get from glycolysis, you can burn in oxidative phosphorylation and get more ATP. You can get 36 ATPs from, an acetyl, from the acetyl-CoA yield from a glycolysis, which means that you can get 38 ATPs per glucose molecule. 
38 ATPs per glucose molecule. Look what happens when you burn fat. When you burn a molecule of palmitate, it's 106 ATPs, but it's slow. It's slow. This stuff happens in type 2 motor units, more than type 1 unit motor units. This is weightlifter Joe shit, right? This stuff happens slow. It happens more preferentially in type 1 motor units, motor neurons. This is marathon Molly shit. But I want you to notice something. And Matt talks about this. This is, really, this is important. The ATP and the work all gets done here in the cytoplasm. It's one big pool of ATP. So it doesn't matter whether you cooked it up in the big slow cooker, right? Or whether you cooked it up on the grill inefficiently. The AT it's like a, a line from a movie about, about drug lords and stuff. And this cop is given a bunch of dirty money to his girlfriend. He says, the money don't know where it came from, sweetheart. The money don't know where it came from. The ATP don't know where it came from. It all comes from the same pool. That's the critical point. That is the critical point. And I'll tell you why. Look at what's happening to your energy utilization. This is a sprint. It's a 30 second sprint. This is the relative contribution of the different energy systems to the work that you're doing. The first six seconds, it's all phosphocreatine creatine hydrolysis and ATP hydrolysis, right? A big chunk of it's coming, not all of it, and a big chunk of, chunk of it's coming from glycolysis. Virtually nothing from oxidative phosphorylation. Virtually nothing from aerobic. As time goes by, you start to run out of phosph This is why we supplement creatine. You start to run out of phosphocreatine, and you start to run out of a ready pool of ATP, and oxidative phosphorylation becomes more important. <coughs> and then you're just out of juice. You can't, you can't keep going at that same rate. Do you begin to see why it is, you know this, but do you begin to see why it is that when we train in the anaerobic energy system, we're also training in the aerobic energy system, but not the other way around? You begin to see why that is? Does that make sense to you? A little bit more now? Because the ATP doesn't know where it came from. I can generate a little ATP like this really fast, but eventually that debt is going to have to be made up. And that is going to bring the oxidative phosphorylation system into play. But it doesn't work the other way. If I'm just doing this, generating ATP with my slow cooker, and that's enough for me to do this, I don't need any help from anaerobic glycolysis. I can generate all the ATP I need here. I don't need any help from this system. But when I'm using this system, I've got to have this system to help me. <coughs> Break time. <coughs>